People after Gettysburg, and it's sort of a backhanded tribute to the importance of Gettysburg as a battle, people were very eager to exculpate Robert E. Lee. They were very eager to get him off the hook. And Gettysburg was so important that it became necessary to find scapegoats. It became important to find someone else who could be made to bear the blame. And the blame-mongering that goes on after Gettysburg almost dwarfs all the blame-mongering for the entire Civil War that occurred in the years after. Well, if Ewell and Longstreet and Stuart didn't lose the battle, then it must have been won by Chamberlain. No. No, no. Were there the, battle, involved, the battle is you know, more... The soldiers right. put up a bronze <laughs> the, to Warren on the, on the little round top, not the Chamberlain. The battle was more lost by Robert E. Lee than it was won by anybody else or lost by anybody else. And the decisions that did cost the Confederacy the Battle of Gettysburg were Robert E. Lee's decisions. Now that's not to say anything cruel or malicious about Robert E. Lee. It's merely to observe a fact that you do not win every battle. He did not win the Battle of Gettysburg. And that, that simply is there. And it's only myth mongers and people who specialize parasite-wise in living off myths, they're the myth deflators, those are the only people who are really interested in ignoring that. On the other hand, who won the battle? Well, there's some difficulty in saying that George G. Meade did. I mean, for one thing, Meade was not there for one-third of the battle. And for another part, Meade's conduct during the battle is almost entirely reactive. He, he responds to situations. He doesn't take initiative. The people who really win the battle are the Chamberlains. But notice I use plural. Because what Joshua Chamberlain did at Little Round Top, now I know it's been overblown, and it's been criticized for being overblown. I've criticized it for being overblown. Still, I also have to make clear that whatever else was overblown about Chamberlain, he did do the right thing. He did do the beau geste at Little Round Top. It was remarkable, and he deserves all the honor that he got for that. What we shouldn't forget, though, is that Chamberlain was just a face in a crowd, because all through the Battle of Gettysburg, and especially on July 2nd, what Chamberlain did at Little Round Top gets repeated place after place after place by officer after officer after officer, taking it right into their own hands, making the right decision, turning the corner at just the precise moment and staving off catastrophe. And that's what comes from George Sears Green on Culp's Hill. It's what comes from Samuel Sprigg Carroll on East Cemetery Hill. It's what comes from Governor Warren. Yeah. It's what comes from Strong, Strong Vincent. Yeah. I mean, Chamberlain didn't get up on Little Round Top on his own hook. He was part of Strong Vincent's brigade. Patrick O'Rourke. I mean, Vincent's brigade, along with Chamberlain, probably wouldn't have survived if Patrick O'Rourke and the 140th New York hadn't heeded Warren's very out-of-chain-of-command instruction to come up to the Little Round Top, and he came up, didn't even take time to form up, didn't even take time to get into line, just threw them right into the battle. Spontaneous and, and saved, epiphanies. Saved yes. What you call them, spontaneous epiphanies is what you say. And that and it seems to be over and over in yeah, this battle. Yeah, it happens over at Norman Hall on uh, July 3rd. Hall's, Hall's brigade just sort of <sighs> spontaneously turns and moves to the support of the Philadelphia Brigade in the angle, preventing the uh, attack by the, the, the spearhead of Pickett's division from penetrating any deeper. They didn't get any orders to do that. I mean, Hall and his regiments just sort of, well, here's a, here's a crisis. We're going in there. So those kinds of spontaneous decisions at that level just get made so routinely that it is the single most important factor in saving, certainly, July 2nd for the Army of the Potomac. I'll tell you one story that is my favorite this way. Lieutenant Colonel Francis Heath, 19th Maine. Here is a man who, up until this point, had just been the son of a lawyer reading law in his father's office. Goes to war. He's in charge of the regiment. The Third Corps has broken to pieces 
and they're streaming in catastrophic chaos back through units of the Second Corps. Out of the smoke and the murk comes Andrew Atkinson Humphreys, who had commanded that division of the Third Corps. His division has gone to pieces, and Humphreys, quite frankly, has lost it. Humphreys comes up to Heath's regiment, and he starts giving them orders to open fire on his own men, use the bayonet on his own men. Francis Heath is appalled at this. He didn't go to war to make war on his own people. So you have this tremendous situation where Humphreys is walking down the line of Heath's regiment telling him, kill my own men. And Heath's walking after him saying, pay no attention to him. <laughs> and for that, I think Francis Heath ought, frankly, to have gotten a medal. Mm. Again, here was someone who was doing the right thing, thinking clearly, a junior officer. No great shakes. He didn't advertise himself after the battle. But it was people like that doing things like that on their own hook mm. that really makes the story of this battle sensational. Uh, out in the West again at the same time, there was also sensation going on. <laughs> and I'm curious, did Kirby, E. Kirby Smith really order no quarter to be given to, uh, to the uh, black Union soldiers? Well, that's, that's what the records say. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, the thing is, is that that was Confederate policy. And one of the things that, that was interesting to me about the story of Milliken's Bend and the... Uh, administrative Confederate response to it uh, was that, okay, they're way out west, you know, communications between there and Richmond take a while, and there's a lot of roadblocks in between here and there, but <clears throat> there's very much, up, up and down the hierarchy, uh, there's very much a concern for doing what's proper. You know, they're not out there making this up as they go along. They're like, oh, well, what do we do with these black soldiers we've captured? This is a new experience. They've not encountered this before. And they're like, well, do we do we shoot them? Do we put them back to, to slavery? Uh, what what do we what do we do here? Uh, and what about these officers? Aren't they inciting slave insurrection? These men were slaves. They're bearing arms against us. These white guys are inciting slave insurrection. And you write a, quite a bit in the, in the book Absolutely. about how the previous slave insurrections, or even John Brown, really worked upon the Southern mind. Absolutely. And... and you know, there's there's a lot I could say about that, but 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 you'll well, have to tune in next to time or read it. the book. That's exactly it. But um, there's a lot in there. But so 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 all of these Confederate generals, McCulloch, uh, Taylor, Kirby Smith, they're all kind of going back and forth trying to figure things out. And, but the bottom line is, you know, no matter what we think today, no matter how we feel about things today, no matter how appalled we are, Confederate law said. White officers in command of black troops. They didn't even call them black troops. It was Negroes in arms. They would not even use the word black soldiers. If Negroes in arms are captured, they are to be uh, returned to slavery or tried by the state, uh, which, you know, if, if a state found them, the, the courts found them guilty of insurrection, they would die. Um, and then the white men, uh, the officers, were considered to be inciting slave insurrection. And the penalty for that was death. That's something you had to take care of right away and in a serious way. And there was a lot at stake here. Not just, not just you know, this one little battle. But the, the, the implication was is that you know, this, this, is, this is crazy. These, these Yankees are just they're desperate. They're desperate because, you know, the war isn't going well. This is before Vicksburg has fallen. This is before Gettysburg has occurred. So at that point in time, things are looking good for the Confederacy. Um, and so, you know, it's, it's a desperate thing that the Yankees are doing here by enlisting these black men. You know, and they're slaves. Come on. You know? How desperate can they be? 
Um, and uh, you so know, so that took desperate measures on their absolutely, side. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely, yeah. it had to be stopped. Actually, I, I have, I have the the answer to this question about Edmund Kirby Smith. Uh, I've been doing some some extra research in the archives, and um, I, I actually have here a handwritten letter by Edmund Kirby Smith. <laughs> it says, "Show them the black flag." E K S. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I love it. This Edmund Love's book is in there, by the way. Was Gettysburg a turning point of the war or the turning point? A turning point of sorts. People ask me, what do you think the turning point of the war was? I tell them, Appomattox. <laughs> um, but Gettysburg is decisive in a number of ways. It's decisive for one thing, in that it really shatters this image of Lee and the Army of Northern Virginia as being invincible. And it is a tremendous restoration to the morale of the Army of the Potomac. Finally, the Army of the Potomac has shown that it could win a battle. I mean, soldiers in the Army write home afterwards, well, what do you think about your Army of the Potomac now? You know, we've, we've shown we can, we can do it. It also comes as an important moment politically because, in fact, those critical fall elections elect Republicans in Pennsylvania and Ohio. And that means that the political future is going to be secure. So it is a, a very important battle that way. It's also a very important battle in terms of the numbers. Fully a third of the army that Lee brings into Pennsylvania ends up as casualties in the campaign. Mm. And while the Army of Northern Virginia does manage to re-recruit and recover, what you can't replace, I mean, you can replace numbers, but what you can't replace is the damage done to the infrastructure, the command infrastructure of the Army, because you've lost colonels, brigadiers, company commanders, NCOs, people who've got experience making an Army work. And that you cannot replace so easily. And that's gone, too, for the Army of Northern Virginia. And the Army of Northern Virginia never really adequately rebuilds that afterwards. After Gettysburg, the Army of Northern Virginia never really takes the strategic initiative again. Its back will always be to the wall. No more invasions. The closest thing to it is Jubal Early's raid in 1864, and not terribly much happens as a result of that. So it's, in, it's a very important... Now, it could have been the decisive battle if George Meade had pressed his advantage. Because in the 10 days between the end of the Battle of Gettysburg and when Lee crosses the Potomac at Williamsport, Maryland, the Potomac is in flood. Lee cannot get across it. His back is against the river. The Army of, of the Potomac has him where they can do annihilation damage. But Meade is so concerned about caution, about not risking the victory he has won, about not overextending himself, that he talks himself or allows himself to be talked into thinking that this is just not something we're going to do. And by the time he does, in fact, summon up the fortitude to, to plan an attack on Lee, Lee has gotten across the river and escaped. Lincoln was so fearful that this would happen that he sent Hannibal Hamlin, his vice president, and the chair of the Senate Military Affairs Committee, Henry Wilson, to Williamsport. And the story, which had been told by Herman Haupt and by Robert Todd Lincoln, was that they'd been equipped with an offer that, Link, that, that they were to communicate to Meade. Lincoln's offer was this, attack. If the attack fails, I will take the blame. If the attack succeeds, you get the credit. But attack! And when Lincoln got the news that, in fact, Lee had escaped, Robert Todd Lincoln was home from Harvard. He comes into his father's office. You know this story, Dan. And he finds that his father's head, his father, head down on the desk, weeping. And his father says, we had them in the palm of our hand. All we had to do was close our fingers. But Lee does get across the river. The war goes on for 21 more months. Yes or no, because Meade was a McClellanite and 
was ready to let them go, thought he had done enough, and perhaps the war could be uh, stopped in another way. I can't read Meade's mind, to, to, to put it that starkly. Meade was, politically speaking, a McClellanite, close to McClellan, and certainly out of sympathy with the Lincoln administration. He's a conservative Democrat. As far as he is concerned, the war has been caused by ultras on both sides. Yeah, he said he didn't want to have an abolitionist, uh, uh, he didn't want to follow the abolitionists right. up into Pennsylvania. That's right. So there is a certain distance between the Lincoln administration's war aims and George Meade's. Does this affect his decision making? Yes, occasionally it does. Is it a case where he deliberately holds his hand? I don't think he deliberately does it. George McClellan's another matter. Yeah, but matter. but George Meade is acting more out of the conviction that the Lincoln administration is a bunch of crazies, and if I make any mistake, I'll suffer for it. If I do anything right, I'll get no credit for it. And if that means that I have to be ultra-cautious and nothing happens, then the Lincoln administration has got no one to blame but themselves for it because they created that environment. Well, the long and the short of it is he does permit Lee to escape. Many people have rushed to Meade's defense. And, and to a certain degree, I understand this. Because how else do you explain how someone defeats Robert E. Lee? I mean, certainly, anyone who would defeat Robert E. Lee in battle has to be the equal in military acumen to Robert E. Lee. So, since he has to be, by jingo, he will be. We will make him that way. He has to be all-wise and all-knowing and, therefore, unsung and disrespected. Uh, well, not necessarily. Well, we've kind of come further than I thought in time, uh, and I want to thank... Uh, both of your publishers for sending you here uh, and two wonderful books that uh, actually are uh, each in their own right and differently uh, have impact in Civil War literature because you have not really read about Milliken's Bend before and this will give you great insight into not only that little battle but also the wider implications of it and Gettysburg is a tour de force, it just is and it just brought me right through. Uh, if I didn't have to keep stopping to write questions, I would have loved it even more.